Hey everybody, welcome back. Music Corner, as always, I'm your host, um, ASAP Rocky. That's right, it's me, ASAP Rocky. It's been a while since we were in the old corner, but uh, we have a pretty good reason for doing so. A list, if you will, and that list is uh, the top 10 times that I peak the audio levels by sneezing. Just kidding, despite my allergies, we're actually here today to talk about 10 great songs on otherwise bad albums. When you discuss music in online music circles, it can often seem very black and white. This album is good, this album is bad, and that means that all of the songs on it are good or bad. But as someone who has reviewed 200 or so albums a year for like six or seven years now, I can tell you that that is obviously not true. It is way more complicated than that. So here are 10 bad albums that have either a reputation for their poor quality or either no reputation at all because they never caught on. And I've done reviews for all of these when they originally came out. And in the mix, somewhere on the album, there is at least one really, really good song. Ready? Let's get it. We're doing the clickbait out of the way. First, very first, gonna get the hip hop heads, short attention spans satisfied. <laughs> Chance the Rapper's The Big Day. Um, it's actually great. The, the song, The Big Day. I mean, the album as trash. But the only way to survive is to go crazy. Yeah, the only way to survive. Yes, right in the middle of Chance the Rapper's disastrous The Big Day. Uh, there is actually a really, really great song, and it is also called The Big Day. And yeah, if you remember anything from this album, it's probably a bunch of terrible lyrics or maybe the awful hook on Hot Shower. But in reality, part, a big part of what makes this thing so grating is that Chance's songwriting and his vision for the record makes it seem like this is such a grand important statement but the nitty-gritty details of the instrumentation and particularly the lyricism are awful but the title track is the one place on this record where it feels like it is really authentically living up to that grandeur it is a huge song despite the sparse instrumentation during the very very memorable francis and the light refrains yes this thing is beautiful it reminds me a lot of when bon Iver and kanye west crossed paths in the past chance the rapper does a weird kind of explosive almost improvisy sounding like breakdown of yelps and shouting on the record it really is one of the only points where it reaches any level of authentic experimentation that just the rest of the record is so dry and doesn't have any of so yes i do actually think this is a really great song and i said that in my review i just I don't know how, but he managed to birth one great, great moment out of the dumpster fire that is this album. And while we're here, I should probably also talk about the second song on our list, which comes to us courtesy of XXX Tentacion, who made two solid records while he was still alive and then has been wrung out posthumously for some of the worst, most underthought, underproduced, poorly managed, and just generally awful sounding posthumous albums and material. It's just gross. So yes, Skins by XFX Tentacion is a pretty rough listen. It is a lot of demos. There are even some blatantly reused ideas. Clearly none of this was finished, but there is one song in the mix that is not only finished, but a thematic journey and a venturing in a new direction for X that is actually amazing, and that song is Train Food. You ever woke up on a train track? 
When the motherfucking clothes on That before you watch you pray to God but ain't no response Trying to scream for hope just so that you can lean on X tells this really really interesting story About having an encounter with death Waking up tied to the train tracks And then contemplating every single moment in his life Everything he's done Wondering in this really explosive finale Whether he's going down or up And his vocals are just really like intoxicatingly reserved in the beginning but they reach a point of this very zany panic by the end the song just develops in a way that i find astounding and so interesting and i said at the time just how much i loved this song just how much better it was from a storytelling perspective than almost anything x had ever written while he was alive so yeah this is far from the worst record i'm going to talk about today in fact i think it's probably one of the better records of the 10 but it still has the very sour taste of exploitation in its mouth, given the way that this thing was marketed and promoted. But I do have to say that at least Train Food is an excellent diamond in the rough. The next two songs are kind of related, um, only in the way that the second one is sort of a thematic ripoff of the first one. But I'll start with number three, uh, Sir Baby Girl. Now, if you don't really roll in queer music circles or you're on the younger side you may not remember that in 2019 early 2019 sir baby girl was kind of billed by some publications as like the next big thing the next big like queer music pop star indie pop fusion star which is weird because I, I think she actually came from like hardcore but yeah this debut album from sir baby girl was actually billed up quite a bit. I wouldn't say I was excited for it because the singles were really a mixed bag, but what got my attention in the first place was one really, really great single, the song Haunted House. This party's just another haunted house. I can't wait to lose all my friends tomorrow. And once I heard this record in its entirety, I just could not believe how much I did not care for the rest of the material. I, I don't go out of my way to review a whole ton of albums that are like garishly bad. If I'm going in to listen and to review something, I really like hope in some part of my brain that it will actually be good. So I was really blindsided going into this record by just how annoying it was. Which is even harder to believe when I continue to enjoy Haunted House to this day. I think it is a fantastic song. It has a great claustrophobic manic energy. It equates this sort of paranoia at a house party as to be a haunted house that is full of creatures that are out to get you. It's very circusy and a little dash of horror movie, but Sir Baby Girl plays it pretty straight. I love the performance. I love the instrumentation. It's just a great, exciting, and most importantly, really catchy little pop tune that has the depth of focus that the rest of these songs are really missing. I mean, they're missing a lot of things, but that's one thing that they're missing. And uh, that means that next up we get to talk about the fourth song on our list, which comes to us courtesy of Dominic Fike's hilariously titled flop album, What Could Possibly Go Wrong. Yes, this is like Dominic Fike's like studio project, his debut album, and yet it is way worse on the production and songwriting end from like his demos. But there is admittedly one very good song in the mix. I pointed it out at the time as really my standout track from the album, and that wasn't a popular opinion at the time, but I think it's started to emerge as one. It's pretty much the only song on the record I ever hear anywhere anymore. And that's Vampires, which is an extremely catchy little number about, guess what, a house party that turns into a haunted house which is run by vampires I so to tell you everyone at this party vampire. actually the metaphor really isn't that deep uh, I would say that Dominic fight fails to explore it conceptually as a song topic nearly as much as sir baby girl does but the similarities are so extremely obvious and for this to be the best song on your record while being 
such an obvious ripoff of a song that wasn't even that old at the time and certainly was able to get enough attention and the refrains on this track mind you are totally borrowed from the Kesha song Honey so it's just like I guess you have to give Dominic Fike credit for combining these influences into a pretty solid song that has proven to stand the test of time, but for this to be the crowning achievement of an otherwise really, really rough listen of an album, I, I guess it tells you a lot about Dominic Fike as an artist. Because you can let Dominic Fike himself tell you all about him as a person. Next up, number five, comes to us courtesy of Steve. Lacey. Now, Steve Lacey is an extremely talented individual. While he's officially a member of the internet, he has done guitar work, songwriting, and production work on all kinds of great projects. If you dig through his credits, he has had his hand in so, so, so much great material, but that did not translate at all to his solo debut album, which is quite a rough listen. Not just because the literal quality of the recording is rough, but also because that style just didn't really seem to lend itself well to Steve Lacey's vibey, psychedelic sound and his woozy approach to songwriting, but there is a big exception. The song Love Too Fast. This is a huge, 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 huge outlier from the rest of the record, not in that it sounds any different, but in that it does this sound justice. It executes it really well. We have these raw, blaring guitars that are like clipping in the mix that are just washing out this entire song and these strained vocals from Steve Lacey, but the combination just clicks. It is so infectious, like I said, so psychedelic, so grand, omnipresent, even intense in a way for as much of a vibe as the track is. Like, you could put this thing on a summer playlist, but it is still a little bit grating if you're paying really close attention to it. It's a fucking awesome, awesome song and just like a surprise coming from this album. Another pretty great artist that I'm not trying to pick on while they're down would be uh, Marina of Marina and the Diamonds, who thankfully has had a much more rewarding comeback. Even though I wasn't crazy about her most recent record, it did have some kick-ass singles. But her previous album before that, a double album, was exhausting and boring and just such a slog that saw her drained of all of her personality and just attempting to write these very mature, often very reserved pop tunes that did not have the personality nor the songwriting to succeed. It's a real difficult slog of a listen. But in the mix is one really great single that I still cannot get enough of. To this day, the song Orange Tree is... I can see the flowers in the greenery. I take a breath of air. I feel free. A wonderful little semi-acoustic breezy pop number with a very memorable hook. Great vocals from Marina on this one. She plays it just low-key enough to sell it while still being a presence on the song. It is nuanced in a way that most of the rest of the record isn't, and I just find it to be a really memorable and enjoyable moment on this, like I said, long and kind of exhausting record. And also now that she has sort of shifted directions away from this more reserved and mature sound into something a little bit more bombastic like her early days, this really stands out as kind of a unique moment of very good songwriting and song crafting in her discography that doesn't really sound much of anything like any of the rest of her great tunes. Number seven comes to us from this Haley Williams album, and it's no secret that I've never been a huge fan of hers, nor the band she has fronted for so long now, and yeah, uh, this record was really, really hard to sit through. And the song that we're going to talk about 
is probably the weakest of the 10 we're gonna talk about today, but it, it serves a very similar purpose. I couldn't leave it off the list. And, and the reason for that is that the start that this album gets off to has to be one of, if not the worst starting run of music I think I've ever heard on any album. Forget any album I've ever reviewed, I could extend this to any album I've ever heard. Like, listening to the first, like, seven songs on this album is one of the most both exhausting and taxing experiences that I have ever had as a reviewer, and I didn't know how else to put that into words other than just calling it a flat zero out of ten start on my review. I've never given a zero out of ten, but the first, like, five tracks of this, which were released as their own, sort of like an EP, that would have been a flat zero, because there's absolutely fucking nothing there. So after this extremely painful, I would argue almost unbearable dirge of music, we get a bright, pleasant, catchy, wonderful little piece of 80s nostalgia on the song Over Yet. Yes, this wonderful little piece of indie pop with a Carly Rae Jepsen ass hook to it is the breath of fresh air that this album needed. I, I really legitimately think that if you took this song out of the mix, I'm not sure I could have even sat down to process and properly review the entire record. It's just so badly needed on the album that when I think about great songs or it just at least rewarding moments and moments that stand out from what is around them on the record, I cannot help but bring up this one because God, does it just stand out. Next up, I want to talk about Lil Yachty, who tends to uh, bounce back and forth very drastically from very solid and enjoyable records in the Lil Boat series to some terrible, awful albums that are not and while I don't think Teenage Emotions is the worst Lil Yachty album ever, it did introduce us to just how low he could set the bar for himself as a lyricist and as a, a conceptualizer of music. This is such a huge nosedive into accessible pop and radio trap from the eccentricities of his breakout project, The Lobo Mixtape. It's just like, blindsiding at some points to realize just how much of a shift it is and the the lyrical bar and and the feature bar and the songwriting bar they're all way down there on this record but i just have to say and this won't be popular because this song got bullied quite a bit after years and years of trying to process this record, I have to say that there are some days where I still wake up and really, really enjoy its lead single, Bring It Back. You need to bring it back to my life, girl. You need to bring it back to my life, girl. You need to bring it back. This is such a goofy little pop tune like the vocals are objectively bad in the way that the vocals on Lobo were objectively bad in an amateurish and extremely endearing way it has this bouncy little instrumental these silly lyrical refrains that don't even fit into their own like meter and structure it's amateurish that really is the word but in a way that i sometimes find really really exciting and really enjoyable but if i'm in a less than fun mood which is rare but sometimes this song may not be clicking with me. I do want to say that there is another really enjoyable track on the record, the song Priorities. Priorities I fuck my priorities I fuck. My priorities I fuck my priorities I fuck. I'm a cheat on my girlfriend who's so loyal for some slice. This song is both kooky and funny in the way that Lil Yachty's best music is and these two kind of stand out uh, from the rest of the I wouldn't call them personality devoid, just personality taxing songs on the rest of Teenage Emotions. Number nine comes to us courtesy of Sundara Karma. Now raise your hand if you've ever heard of Sundara Karma. Now, now look around and everybody who raised their hand 
is British. I don't know why exactly nobody I've ever met in real life in America has ever heard of this band, um, because, you know, they seem to attract some pretty significant attention. If you look at their streaming numbers, they're, they're doing okay. In fact, I thought their debut album was decent. It was what attracted me to the band in the first place. I think it was one of the first records that I reviewed in the year it came out. So much so that I paid attention to them long enough for them to release a sophomore album. And while in the meantime, they have collaborated with Clarence Clarity on a few EPs that were okay, um, I really, really did think that this sophomore album was like a career killer. It's so bad. Um, oh my god, it's such a difficult listen, like, ugh. I don't even know how exactly to put it without just reading the review I wrote at the time. It's like, these songs are so lifeless and so generic, except for when the band randomly seems to get the motivation to try something very outside the box, and they do so, and it's so overbearingly bombastic and annoying and terrible, there's just nothing in the middle that is a mix of the good things without all of the forgettableness or overbearing, unbearable, just obnoxiousness. Well, there is actually one song, the track, The Higher States. Yes, I have to admit that I do like this track quite a bit. I believe it's one of the more popular, more well-known songs from the record, and that doesn't surprise me because, like I said, we've been in the thick of 80s revivalism for a very long time now. While this song is bombastic in the way that only a child bore of the 2010s can be, there is also like a classic indie, rocky, glammy, maybe even goth, new waviness to it. Like, when you hear the vocals on the hook on this thing, it sounds like something that The Cure would do, or maybe even like the horrors on one of their brighter tunes. But yeah, this thing just barely skirts under the line of being obnoxious by having these triumphant instrumental passages, these very memorable refrains. It is loud, it is in your face, but it's composed and performed in a way that doesn't go too far like most of the rest of the band's material does. It never really reaches into that point of being annoying or obnoxious. It's just a good tune. And finally, at number 10, we're talking Big Crit, who I've never really been a huge fan of and who some of my negative reviews for have got me in hot water with hip-hop heads out there. And yeah, most of his albums aren't terrible, but to me, they were just inconsistent and often very forgettable, but this one actually fucking sucks and is really, really hard to listen to. Which is funny because hidden within the walls of this track is one of my favorite Big Crit songs ever, the song Energy. I need your energy. This world is killing me. And that opinion doesn't seem to be exclusive to me. I feel like I remember hearing this song on like some commercial that played in the NBA Finals a few years ago. Like there was some like Nike or some Adidas or some like Mountain Dew shit that was grabbing this song and running with it, which is fair because it's a pretty good track. And more importantly, unlike so much of Crit's discography, it has a really great hook, a really memorable hook that both fills in the void of his raps with some catchy refrains to add some levity and also ties the song together thematically and emotionally. So yeah, I like this song quite a bit, and while I would not necessarily recommend listening to this Crit album, or really any of the albums that we've talked about today, on even even the most obnoxious of uh, hip-hop Twitter trolls, I do think that each of them contains at least one song that is in some way worth your time or I guess in the case of some of these records, if not worth your time, it's at least a moment that stands out from the rest of the songs on the album, but in a good way. And yes, before any of you ask, I will absolutely, at some point in the future, make a companion video about bad songs on good records, and uh, that one is certainly more likely to piss some people off. But in the meantime, I've been uh, ASAP Rocky, and uh, I've got to go uh, look after my newborn kids, so I'll see you guys next time.